Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. So I am excited. Today's video is going to be about Le Nozze di Figaro, The Marriage of Figaro by Mozart. I absolutely love this opera. I studied it a lot and worked at it, but I mostly watched it so many times. And I think the reason or the coolest thing about it is how Mozart defines all of the characters' personalities through music. So today I thought I would show you a little bit how he does this, what musical resources he uses to do this. And just for the sake of time, I'm only going to focus on the two main couples, which are Figaro and Susanna and the Count and the Countess. And at the end, I'm going to refer to the finale because there are many interpretations of it and I would like to share it with you guys and see what you think. So in a nutshell, this is the plot of the opera. Figaro and Susanna are going to get married on this day. They work for the Count and the Countess, but there is a problem. The Count wants to reinstate an old abolished law that means he, the Count, has a right to spend the night with Susanna on her wedding night to Figaro. Yeah, it's a completely messed up law that, by the way, existed. And so the whole opera is Susanna teaming up with Figaro and the Countess, who is constantly being cheated on, to get their way, to be able to get married. So let's look at our characters. First, Figaro. So Figaro is portrayed as a kind-hearted person, but who is also a bit of a master of deception. So he has all these plots and plans to get his way, but it's never a direct confrontation. It's always this uh, subtle metaphors and mind games. Let's remember that Figaro was the one that helped the Count get married to Rosina in the first part of the trilogy, so in Barber of Seville. So he used to be on the Count's team and now the Count is after his fiancée. So his first aria comes pretty early in the first act and after he found out about the Count's plans, he is pretty much saying, okay, you want to do this little dance, fine, but we'll dance to my tune. <laughs> But the stroke of genius here is that Mozart uses two dances to structure this aria. First, a minuet, and then a counter dance, which is a quick pace dance. The minuet at the time was a dance that was sort of shared by both the noble and the middle class and lower class, so everybody would know how to dance it. But the counter dance was only danced by middle and lower classes, so someone noble like the count wouldn't know how to dance it. So in a way, Figaro here is imagining that he is dragging the Count into his territory. He's making him dizzy with this fast-paced counter dance that he doesn't know how to dance. And so in this aria, Figaro is now in control of the situation by way of manipulating, not straight confrontation. I should have said this before, but this is all in Figaro's mind. He's not actually singing this to the Count, he is alone. So now let's discuss the Count. So the Count's aria comes in the third act. For a bit of context, in this aria he just overheard Susanna and Figaro talk and he's starting to realize he is going into a trap. So a lot of the musical elements that we see in the Count's aria belonged to a type of opera called Opera Seria, which at the time had a lot of fixed characteristics, but mostly it was thought out for the nobility, so for courts, and it always uh, discussed sort of serious topics, heroes, it was very declamatory, sometimes tragic, and it had a lot of fixed musical characteristics. So a lot of the elements that we can see from this type of opera in the Count's aria are, for example, the use of dotted rhythms, uh, the orchestration with timpanis and trumpets and the very fast-paced figurations in the strings, for example, or embellishments. And also the tonality of the major signified at the time uh, pomp, bravura, and nobility. So you would think the Count would come across as a very noble, respectable person, but he doesn't really. He comes off as a bit uh, unhinged and unreasonable. And Mozart accomplished this in two ways. One is bar structure. So normally phrases are grouped by either two bars or four bars, so even numbers. There are a lot of places in this aria where Mozart does three bar groupings, and that gives the whole thing a little bit of a sense of instability and also draws our attention to what he's saying, which is usually the most cruel or the most unreasonable things. For example, here. Non 
And the other reason why the count comes across as a little bit unhinged is because it reminds us to a previous aria that we heard, which is Bartolo's aria. So Bartolo is a pretty ridiculous character. He's old fashioned. He thinks everybody respects him, but they don't really. And he gets this aria that starts off with all of these elements from the opera seria, so dotted rhythms and trumpets and D major. But at a point you get a lot of elements of the opera buffa, like this very, very fast paced repeated note section. So when we get to the Count's aria, because it shares so many things with Bartolo's aria, it comes across as a little bit unreasonable or unhinged, but this is not done overtly by Mozart. He still gives him the treatment of a serious noble person, but shows us what he really thinks of the Count. Now, there is going to be one important moment where the Count is going to get a completely different musical treatment, and that will come as well in the end. So moving on to Susanna. So Susanna is portrayed as a very quick-minded, quick-paced character. She is smart and she's always on the move. We see this a lot in the type of uh, music that Mozart writes for her, which is usually very fast-paced, light music. She's also a little bit quicker in understanding the truth behind things. For example, behind the intentions of the Count. Look at this exchange where Figaro is super happy that he has a room near the Count that is so convenient and Susanna is trying to show him why the Count gave them that room so close to his. And note how to the happy major tune that Figaro sings Susanna sort of answers in this minor altered mode, trying to sort of mock him and go like, don't you see why he would like this? We then move on to her first aria and here she also doesn't stop. She doesn't get a these are my feelings aria. She is going, she's actually dressing Cherubino all throughout her first aria, so it's an action aria. And she finally gets to stop at her second aria by the end of the opera. But this aria is not really what she feels. She is pretending. So at this point, Figaro thinks that she might be about to cheat on him and he's eavesdropping and she knows this and she wants to teach him a lesson and make him suffer, so she sings this romantic aria where she pretends to be excited about an encounter with the Count that is never going to happen. But, you know, she wants to make him feel bad for mistrusting her. So what she's singing is not really what she's feeling. It's a pretend show for Figaro. So even though she gets this moment to reflect, you don't really know if this is what's on her mind. So finally, the Countess. So the Countess is a very melancholic and nostalgic character. She's been completely forgotten by the Count who previously had fought so hard for her. And this is shown to us in a very beautiful way, which is she doesn't appear in the opera until act two. She's mentioned, but she's not there. And when act two opens, it's just a very, very short cavatina that only has four verses. She doesn't get this two-part aria with a recitativo as an introduction. And this first aria has an instrumental introduction that shows a bit the complexity of her character. Because on the one hand, she's gonna be active and fight for retribution and to help Susanna. But on the other hand, she's also going to reflect and be very nostalgic about things all throughout the opera. So this is shown, for example, by Mozart putting these two phrases together, each one representing these two parts of her personality. And I think Mozart felt a lot of compassion for her, and this is shown in the second aria that she has. So after a proper recitativo accompagnato, sort of fitting of opera seria and a noble character, because she is a noble lady at the end of the day, the first part of her aria is going to be this very introspective music where she thinks, where have my happiness days gone? 
and later Mozart will take this aria and use it as inspiration for a religious piece, which is the Agnus Dei movement of a coronation mass. And so you will see that the materials are almost identical, but the key is different and one is set in a three per bar meter and the other one in a duple meter. And this sort of religious or sort of, let's say prayer-like music comes back at the finale. So why do I say there are different interpretations of the finale? So what happens here is that after the count has been exposed in front of everybody for the liar and cheater that he is, he turns to the countess and apologizes and the countess forgives him. And the question here is, does he mean it and does she mean it? So first we could look at the musical language that Mozart uses for this moment. If we compare this ask of forgiveness from the Count to a previous one, it seems pretty obvious that he means it. <laughs> But a key thing here is tempo. So Mozart writes a couple of fermatas between both sentences, which bring the whole thing to a bit of a standstill. And usually this is also done in a very slow tempo like this one. But Mozart actually wrote andante for this section, which means sort of walking pace or going. So it really all comes down to this. If you make time sort of stop and, and you slow it down, then it really feels like the Count is reflecting, he's truly sorry, and that the Countess is also reflecting and she decides to forgive him. If you go about this a bit quicker, well, then it's like they're putting this under the rug, they're in front of all of their servants, they need to, you know, make it look like they're gonna go back to a happy marriage, even though they're not. So, what do you think? I always found this finale so heartwarming and I guess that means I want to believe that he means it but I want to hear from you how do you interpret it have any of you sung any of these parts and what do you feel about it and I hope you like this video if you did uh, please like and subscribe that really helps me create more videos of this and on that topic if there's anything you would like me to cover also please let me know and I will see you next time